right under our noses, in our homes, cities and towns, on our sofas and laps, a quiet invasion has been taking place. The cat is now officially the most popular pet in the Western world. In Britain alone, it's reckoned there are 12 million cats. A vast, softly purring army, which it seems we are utterly powerless to resist. And yet, for thousands of years, no creature has divided us quite like this one. Are they regal or simply cold and remote? Devoted pets or as irrepressibly wild as their big cousins? How am I to capture the essence of this puzzling creature, one that so many adore and so many others find deeply unsettling? To do that, I'm turning cat detective. Unraveling this feline enigma everywhere, from the magical tombs of ancient Egypt. How oh, brilliant, it's all done by reflection. To a bizarre medieval cat festival in Belgium. From the cats who formed a Chicago rock band. To a cat in fancy dress. It must be so strange being slightly deaf inside a pink rabbit hat. I'll be tracking down the amazing big cats too, coming face to face with the lord of the Mayan jungle. All the strength and majesty of these creatures, you can't believe how beautiful they are. And armed to rasping tongue with the world's fastest cat. I'm trying to talk normally with them, my arm being licked by a cheetah. All to discover exactly why it is that cats divide us so much. And how one of nature's most efficient serial killers ended up as our favorite fireside companion. This is my journey into the world of the cat. My journey begins here, at home. And it begins with a confession. We don't have a cat. Well, not anymore. For 18 years, we had a gorgeous cat called the Bee. When he died, I missed him more than I could ever have imagined. I still think about him every day. We even gave him a little gravestone. People say that you choose a dog, but the cat chooses you. And people say that cats are aloof. Well, I don't know about that. All I know is that the bee, our beloved cat, was much more than a pet. He was a friend. We loved him dearly. And, you know, I think he loved us dearly, too. And yet, I wonder if I ever really knew the bee any more than I know the neighborhood cats that now wander through our garden. Unlike dogs, so much of what cats do is secret and nocturnal, mysterious. It helps to explain why some people find them so disturbing and why so many others find cats irresistible. But where does this deep divide spring from? First stop on my journey, a cat show in Milton Keynes to find the true aficionados, the ones whose absolute faith in cats is beyond doubt. In the West, cat shows like this are the ultimate expression of our modern obsession with cats. Hello, darling. Hi. Yes, sweet one. And you can see why. Was there ever an animal quite as beguiling as the cat? It's another Bengal man. Or as adorable as a kitten? Called what? Scylla. Scylla. Scylla Block. <laughs> Quite a think of that. Beautiful blue eyes and the slightly Barbara Streisand look. I think it's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Over the years, we've engineered around a hundred breeds of cat. From green eyes to blue, from long hair to no hair whatsoever. And what breed is she? She's a sphinx. It's a Turkish, Turkish. fan. It's a snow thing. This is a Singapore cat. Very bright, very lively. But look around any cat show like this and you'll notice something which has never changed. It's women, not men, who are least able to resist the lure of the cat. Hard to believe that a few hundred years ago, many of these women, including me, might have been burned at the stake. Along with their cats. Because the terrible truth is, despite thousands of years of our deepest devotion to cats, there's a very dark side to our feline obsession. Thankfully, we don't torture witches and their cats anymore. 
But once every three years in Belgium, people gather to remember a time when we did. On a warm afternoon in the town of Ypres, their world-famous cat parade is now in full swing. It's all a bit surreal, yet, so far at least, it seems pretty harmless. I can't resist joining in the fun. But courtesy of the town jester, the festival culminates in a rather shocking ritual. In Ypres, 500 years ago, nine lives wouldn't have been enough for even the sturdiest of cats. Europe had gone witch-mad, and here in Belgium, they took to slinging live witches' cats off the tops of high buildings. In fact, it wasn't until 1817 that this barbaric ritual was stopped. It's an unlikely thing to commemorate, but thankfully today, the cats here are merely toys. It's so strange because even though this is a sort of carnival day and everybody's having such fun and they're only toy cats, a knife of fear and pain goes through me. Just to think a short time ago they were throwing real live cats out of here simply because of the superstition that cats contained evil spirits. And it wasn't just the Belgians. In the Middle Ages it was believed that Satan often took the form of a cat. And all over Europe they were tortured and ritually killed in their thousands, often also burning alive the poor innocent women who owned them. Was there ever a creature which divided us so much? For a thousand years we persecuted the cat as an agent of the devil, and yet nowadays we go all gooey over them in cat shows. For good or evil, we've long believed that cats have some sort of mysterious magical powers. But where on earth did that come from? Who owned the first cat? And when? And where? Egypt, the land of the pharaohs. It was here, three and a half thousand years ago, that wild African cats first shimmied and sashayed their way into human company. And even today, there are few cities on the planet quite as comfortable with its cats as Cairo. They're everywhere, literally crawling out of every nook and cranny. Once you tune your eye in to look cat eyes, once you get your cat's eyes in, you can see little cats, tiny cats, slim cats, cats resting by mosques. These are the cats who are looking after the door. Just one on each side. These cats are mostly feral, homeless, unowned, just like their early ancestors. But for all their wildness, they're every bit as loved as the cats which pose for rosettes at shows. Perhaps even more so. It's just incredible how many cats there are and how many people treated them so kindly. This charming gentleman here who's got a special paper bag full of meat so that he can look after them and they're in beautiful condition. A little dapple patting away. It's just wonderful. The people don't kick them or hurt them, they just smile at them. But in a largely Muslim city like Cairo, that's really no surprise. It's said the Prophet Muhammad had a real soft spot for cats. There's a story that when he blessed his own pet cat on the forehead, he left the mark of his fingers like a giant M, a mark that's been passed down through countless generations of cats. But when and where did cats come to be with us in the first place? And how did they weave their magic on us? To find out, I'm heading way back in time to the mysterious tombs of the dead in Thebes. Before they came to live with us, cats foraged for their living in the blistering heat of the Sahara Desert. Hardly surprising then that the rise of human civilization by the Nile seemed like easier pickings. But the early Egyptian farmers got something out of it too. Grain silos attracted vermin, the vermin attracted hungry African wild cats, and before long, a rather remarkable relationship had been formed. A relationship first recorded in an extraordinary location.
400 miles to the south of Cairo, on the west bank of the River Nile, lies Thebes, the city of the dead. It's here that the ancient Egyptians buried their pharaohs and their aristocrats in lavish tombs. Salam alaikum. Shukran. Thank you, shukran. Tombs adorned with murals celebrating their daily lives in intimate detail. This is the tomb of Nacht. He was the royal astronomer, and here's Nacht himself looking very fine, quite a dark, kind of copper-coloured body. And this is his beautiful wife, Tawi. And round here you can see that they've prepared. This is the beginning of the feasting. And here we can see them sitting at table. Top part of the picture's gone. Nakt's lovely little brown feet, Tawi's little pale feet, and underneath Tawi's chair, the most adorable tabby cat eating a fish. Now, in those days, cats always sat underneath women's chairs in all these tomb paintings. It's something to do with fertility and somehow links cats with women all the time. Tawi probably took a fish off the table and said, here, yeah, was just dropped it down. It's extraordinary. Here is evidence three and a half thousand years old showing how these wild desert scavengers had quite cheerfully taken up lodgings right under our feet. Salam alaikum. <laughs> Oh, nice to see you. Can I see the picture of the cat? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah? Thank you. Oh. I've been told that this tomb has more of the story. Oh, look. There's a light. I'm going to just creep in here. With a little mirror magic, all is revealed. How brilliant, it's all done by reflection. <gasps> Look at this. So this is a hunting scene. Now there's birds all flying up, chaps throwing sticks at them. And here's a gorgeous little cat. There is a story that the Egyptians used to use cats, maybe to flush out the birds, but they used to take them hunting with them. They've also seemed to have taken their tame rat to them, I don't know. Sometimes, of course, I think cats just take it upon themselves to follow human beings, so they might have just gone on his own accord. But I suspect that these might have been hunting cats. Who knows? It's not difficult to connect the cats in these ancient murals with the cats in our own back gardens. Predatory, solitary. Yet at the same time, affectionate and gentle. And it's not that hard to understand what happened next either. Maybe it was the big eyes or the mesmerizing way cats move but the Egyptians very quickly elevated the cat from beloved pet to divine god. A goddess, in fact, naturally. With both a serene face and a frightening face. A goddess whose cult would last over 2,000 years, longer so far than either Christianity or Islam. Today its worshippers are long gone, unless you count the ladies at cat shows, but here, in the Egyptian museum in Cairo, I can still see the evidence of this mighty feline goddess with two faces. This is the lioness goddess Sekhmet, and she is um, sort of the scarier side of cat divinities. And she's supposed to be powerful, she protects women, and she, of course, brings warfare and plague, if she so chooses. And she's got a uraeus snake on her forehead. So that could kill? Yes. That would sort of be a don't mess with me kind of thing. Yes. And right now she's wearing his nice sheath dress and sitting down and being beautiful. But of course the implicit in it is because she is a lioness, she can strike out and kill. And does she have an alter ego? Yes, her alter ego is much nicer and calmer. Sort of the cat goddess in a tamer way, and that's Bastet. Bastet, the cat goddess. Statuesque, sublime the quintessential cat. Bastet was the symbol of love and beauty and music and basically self-indulgence, as you'd expect from a cat. So this is the kind of, of goddess a lot of people would be having in their house shrines. But look at these ones up here. These are just exquisite. They're fabulous. 
They're terribly lifelike. I've seen cats looking just like that. Do you like cats? I do like cats. I'm allergic to them, but I like them. In ancient Egypt, pet cats were adored. Whenever one died, the entire family would shave their heads in mourning. But not all cats were pets. There were other cats, bred to be offered to Bastet, in the hope of earning her blessing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, to do that, they had to be dead. When they went to the temple of Bastet, they made offerings of mummified cats. And the idea was that because a cat was taking the message, the goddess would pay much more attention to it. And were, they, were these tame cats or cats around the temple? How did they get the cats for the mumming? They probably bred them in catteries, and you would have just thousands and thousands of cats there. We have x-rayed them, so you get a sense of what's inside. And it's really quite surprising. Look at that. What is a bit awful about this particular one is the neck has been broken because they couldn't always wait for cats to die. So we have some cat mummies where their heads have been bashed in or they're being strangled. <gasps> Little cat. That one's an interesting one because... Um, oh, my well, God, what is it? Well, you can see it's a jumble. When they didn't have enough cats, they would just gather up a few bones and mummify that and make it look beautiful like a cat should be. So that's extraordinary thing. This is sort of cat hamburger, if that doesn't sound too frightful. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of just sort of chopped up and made into a shape. That, that's very accurate, though, and it certainly looks that way. What's the Egyptian word for cat? Meow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it? Yes, it really is. <laughs> it sounds familiar, doesn't it? The cat with two faces. Cats as angels and cats as demons. Egypt is the home of the original prototype cat, the Mao, and whatever shape or pattern your pet cat is, it's descended from this ancient line of stripy tabby. In Egypt, the land where cats first walked amongst us, there are many who love them, but there are also others who are out to destroy them. Although in some countries, Maos can fetch well over a thousand pounds a kitten, here in Cairo, they still run wild in the streets. Unfortunately, some government officials think the only way to control them is by shooting and poisoning them. From a house in the Cairo suburbs, Maged Abdel Razek is on a mission to rescue them. Oh, now look, this must be one of the newest arrivals. Yes, this is our newest guest, Aida. Aida, how old, old is she? Her? Yes, I do. She's about seven weeks old. Seven weeks old? Yes. And she was found? She was found by yeah. a lady when she was about five days old, and I had to take care of her. You did this yourself? You fed her, what, with a little pen dropper? Yes, like about six or seven times a day. Well, she's triumphant. She's quite got a little fat tummy. She's overfed now. <laughs> <laughs> but tell yeah. me, what, what makes a Mao cat? The Mao cats are the only naturally spotted cats. With striped legs? Yes, that's right. Yes, so they're half a correct. leopard and half a tiger? Yes, it's a little tiger. <laughs> Can take her home. Little you want to adopt tiger. her? I do like anything. <laughs> I hope the Egyptian government finds a better way to look after these beautiful Mao cats. After all, this was the land where we first welcomed and then worshipped this strange, paradoxical creature. Three and a half thousand years later, are we any less torn and divided by this humble beast? Is there anywhere that still accords cats the same adoration as Bastet? Or still harbors fears about their monstrous powers? To find out, I'm traveling to the other side of the world, to the country where the cat is very definitely the queen bee. For an animal that sleeps up to 20 hours a day, it's truly amazing the fuss cats have caused. We've bowed before them as gods. We've treated them as devils. Surely in the 21st century, those strange beliefs must be a thing of the past. Well, not quite. On the face of it, Tokyo is one of the world's most high-speed, high-tech cities. But look in virtually any shop or restaurant and you'll find the ancient spirit of Bastet a little Japanese cat that's so famous it's been exported all over the world. Maniki Neko, the lucky cat, has one paw raised to beckon in good fortune. So for most Japanese, cats are lucky. 
In fact, they're now so besotted with the real thing, the demand for pet cats here is one of the fastest growing in the world. I've recruited local cat lover Mary Corbett to help me explore a city where the feline obsession knows no bounds and where no self-respecting cat should be caught naked. For the very best in feline haute couture, the Stella McCartney to Tokyo's finest cats, look no further than Takako Iwasa. Takako, look at this. <gasps> most cats in most places look overdressed wearing a collar and a bell, but not here. Oh. Oh. <laughs> For Takako, the cat tailor, cats aren't just lucky, they're the objects of adoration. Takako, where do you get your inspiration from now for making, for instance, I see <laughs> some extraordinary things. I see little cows' heads here and kind of frogs. She's not sure, but she received something on the right side of her brain and it seems to come from outer space. <laughs> may we see um may we see some of your beautiful clothes on a cat? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> this handsome, rather long suffering Scottish foldier is Kotaro, clothes hanger for all Takako's boy cat costumes. Yay. Oh. Oh. oh you look fine, darling. You look quite unlike a cat. <laughs> Oh, he's, he's taken his hat off. Okay, oh, like sort of oh, Tom Kitten, he doesn't have to take his clothes off. Oh, One of the most popular outfits is a frog. Good cat. <laughs> oh, darling, good cat. Oh, God, he's turning into a mouse now. I wonder what this can do to a cat frog. Mouse cat. <laughs> oh, you look beautiful. We must never laugh at them, but look how fine he looks. He looks so beautiful. <laughs> but who can resist a smile when the lovely Prin, short for princess, models her tiara? Yeah, she doesn't know another cat that can wear a crown no. without securing it in place. I never knew a cat would tolerate clothes. Mm. And I think Prin is, is remarkable, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> Tranquil and very beautiful. Good girl. Must be so strange being slightly deaf inside a pink rabbit hat. It's hard to imagine the wild street cats of Cairo dressed like this. And yet in both cities, cats are revered like nowhere else. Lucky Cat, Maneki Neko, like a modern Bastet, is everywhere, bringing blessings to the Japanese. And if you look closely, you'll notice a distinct similarity with another strangely familiar cat. Oh, look, Mary, Hello Kitty. Everybody knows Hello Kitty. And she's been chosen as a new poster girl for a Visit Japan campaign. Oh, look. A little kitty like this, with its own little kitty bag. And Maneki Kitty. Maneki Kitty, with the good luck. Yes, picking in the good luck. Fishy Kitty. Oh, strange, though. Bean bag? Bean bag? Bean bag. Bean bag. Oh, yes. oh, look, in a kimono kitty. Gosh, it's everywhere, isn't it? And look at all these up here. Hello Kitty, everything. Just toys and little purses, exercise books, pencils, pots, things, stuff, earrings, dangly bits. For children of all ages. The strange thing is, something's going wrong with me because I really want this stuff now. I've actually got some, I've got quite a lot of thousands of and Hello Kitty is just the beginning. Thanks to the lucky cat, Maneki Neko, Japan is filled with a positive energy of cuddly, happy pussycat characters. Cat toys, cat robots, cat cartoons. And is he based on Maneki Neko? Yes, I understand he was inspired by the Maneki Neko, so he brings good fortune. But much as it looks like a cartoon character, the real Maneki Neko is not a toy. Its roots are powerful and old, the stuff of samurai lords and storms. And it's a story which starts here in a quiet little Tokyo suburb, setting for the serene and entirely unexpected Zen Buddhist temple of Gotokuchi.
The true guardian of the lucky cat legend is the head priest of Gotokuji. In the grounds of the temple is a little shrine dedicated exclusively to Manaki Neko. So, good then. So, this is the building that brings good fortune. Mm. Oh, lovely. It's beautiful. The real Holy of Holies, the Lucky Cat's altar, is hidden inside the little temple. Look at this. Cats, cats, cats. Tambuya hataki no kishin ga attari. The head priest explains how the legend first began. Over 350 years ago, this was an impoverished, very poor temple, and there was just one monk here, and he shared what little food he had with this cat. And he said to the cat, Well, one day I know you will bring us great fortune. One day he heard a lot of noise outside the gate, and the cat was there beckoning these lords who were. Riding by on their horses. The Lord followed the cat's beckoning, and just as they came in, lightning struck the tree that they had been under. So they would have been killed? Yes, well, that's what the Lord thought, and he was very, very grateful for the cat having invited him in. It's a fabulous story. You can see why the Japanese took Manaki Neko to their hearts, always in the hope it would save them from disaster, too. Look at these cats! From all over Japan, pilgrims travel here to seek the blessing of the lucky cat. So many, and some are big, and some are tiny. True devotees see the cat almost as a tiny incarnation of the Buddha, a kind of mini god, really. So, worshippers would purchase these cats, and then they would pray that they may meet good people in their lives. When their wishes come true, they will bring the cat back. To the temple and offer thanks. So these these cats have performed great things so all for the families. All good news, all happy wishes, all happy wishes. But even here, in a country besotted with its lucky cats, you can detect that familiar ancient legacy of fear and suspicion. Take the bullet train out of Tokyo, and you enter an older, more traditional Japan. Where sinister legends live on, horrifying tales which speak of the Bake Neko, an evil monster cat. In an old farmhouse, curled up by the fire with a pair of rather unscary cats, legend expert Akiko Manabe tells the tale of an evil pet cat that can change its shape. Once upon a time, there was a family. They loved a cat. Suddenly, that cat was missing, and wife's behavior became very strange. She ate in her own room. She told the family, "Don't, don't, don't look into my room when I'm eating." But the husband peeked into her room. She was eating the dead mice, dead birds, dead fish. When the wife turned her face to the husband, her face became the face of the cat. It turned out the cat had killed her and ate her up, and pretended to be the wife. How awful! Can you imagine being that husband looking through, and it's like, and it looks like a cat. <laughs> you think it's your wife, and it's got a cat face. Is it always women? Cats turn into women.、Uh, most of the cases are women, because the people think women are more cruel than men. <laughs> Catty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems there's such a contrast between the happy, smiling cat who brings you love and luck, and this darker side, the baggy neko cat, which turns into a monster. It seems that even today we're not quite sure if cats are good or evil. I know what I think, but who knows? Back in the West today, cats are so spoiled it's easy to forget what a rotten time they've had of it in the past, and what ridiculous superstitions we've linked to them. 
know about witches' cats and black cats crossing your path, but that's just the beginning. Back in the old days, they were routinely flinging cats out of belfries. They used to say that a cat could suck the breath out of a sleeping baby, and that to eat the warm brains of a cat would make you invisible. They said that planting a live cat in your garden would keep down the weeds. We've forgotten now, but for hundreds of years, we used to be terribly cruel to cats. Ever since the pharaohs, we've been unable to agree about cats, and we still can't really decide whether to love them or loathe them. How could how could something so innocent and beautiful be so divisive? One man who thinks he knows the answer is top feline expert Roger Tabor. Roger, we've seen cats treated as gods and goddesses. We've also seen them demonised and treated as the devil. Such extreme feelings to the cat. Why is that? It's crazy, isn't it? But in reality, they're just the flip sides of the same coin. We recognise that there is something strange mm -hmm. about the, about them, and at the same time, you recognise they've deified it. It's it's always. The otherworldliness. And what is the otherworldliness about the cat? Yes. Well, when you look at them, you've got a package. Mm. It's a nocturnal, lone hunter. When you're dealing with an animal which is not a pack animal, then you're dealing with an animal that doesn't like being told what to do. With the dog, you are either the boss or you are bossed. But with the cat, it thinks it through for itself. It's much more independent. So we've always been a bit wary, a bit distant. We mm. understand that they are somehow other, somehow wild, somehow strange. The solitary hunter lurking within. The irrepressibly wild feline heart. Is that why we find cats both inspiring and perplexing? If it's true. Then my challenge now is to meet the full force of that wild side, face to face. Hidden deep in the jungles of Central America lives the ultimate mysterious solitary feline. Just like the cats of Egypt, Europe, and Japan, the mighty jaguar both transfixed and terrified an ancient civilization. Unfortunately, this great cat is paying the ultimate price for our fear. Rollover Labradors and rollover Cocker Spaniels. In the 21st century, the cat is the new top dog. Globally, there are now over 200 million of them living in our homes. And yet, on this journey, I've learned just how deeply cats divide us. It seems it's their solitary nature which is to blame. But is this the same spirit our cats still share with their wild cousins? The Mayan jungle in the heart of Central America is home to the world's most elusive big cat, the ultimate solitary hunter. Centuries before the arrival of the domestic cat, the Mayans worshipped the jaguar with the self-same mixture of fear and adoration. But actually, finding one is a serious challenge. If anyone can help me, it's Mexico's top jaguar conservationist, Gerardo Ceballos. Before we begin scouring the jungle for this mysterious beast, Herodes brought me to an ancient ruined city to get a bird's eye view of the enormity of our task. So this is one of the largest oh. ones. Look at that. Herodes, it's immense. This huge area is probably the second largest in the Mayan world. Calakmul, once a metropolis of 50,000 people, flourished for over 500 years. By 900 AD, this civilization had collapsed. And with it, the cult of the jaguar, as the Mayans abandoned their cities for good. So, Gerardo, tell me about the cultural connection between the Mayan people and the jaguar. Well, in Mayan mythology, jaguars were very powerful spirit living in the forest that could cause you damage. On the one hand, they hate the jaguar because it's killing their cattle and their goats. But on the other hand, they really respect it. It's a mixture of like a mystical respect, but also a lot of fear to the jaguar. They must have been extraordinarily. Um, elusive to see because somebody said that seeing a jaguar is like seeing vapor, like a mist. You, you're staring at it, exactly. and you don't know if you're seeing a jaguar. Respect and fear—it sounds so familiar. That same ancient response to the cat, mirrored here with America's top jungle predator. Wow! Look at this. Ay, Very ay, ay, ay. impressive. 
So everything is like a probably 1.5 million hectares covered by forest. But you can't see, apart from these ancient pyramid sort of buildings, there's, n there's not another There is buildings. not a single person inside here. In 360 there. degrees, all the way around, nothing, no, nothing. Nothing. It's dense forest now, but a thousand years ago, the Mayans destroyed their own way of life by greedily chopping down the precious trees they needed to sustain life. This must have been strange, a treeless m metropolis. Exactly. When the Mayas collapsed, it was more on a local or regional uh, impact. Then lots of the species, like the jaguar, they, they were able to move to other areas where there were forests and survive. What is happening today is that we're destroying all the forests, you know. So the jaguar is in danger and it may be, it disappear. Yeah. And if we cut it down now, they've got nowhere to go. Exactly. I'll do whatever it takes to look one of these big cats in the eye, to see if I recognize the wild heart that beats inside every domestic cat, even if it means getting up at three in the morning. We know less about the jaguar than about almost any of the other big cats, and that's because they're so hard to see, and they're so very shy. But this morning, we're going to have a very good shot at finding one. We've got a bunch of dogs and a bunch of men here to see if we get lucky. <laughs> Gerardo and his team are on a mission to find and study as many wild jaguar as possible and hopefully figure out why these great cats are dwindling so dangerously in number. Do the dogs get excited before we go? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they want to go. They want to go. Early morning before the sun rises is generally when jaguars are most active and easiest to spot. And even here, nothing beats a dog when it comes to running down cats. They're being tied by the chains into the back of the van so they don't all jump out. They're peaceful and sweet and waggy and they just look so friendly. But I think that will change once we get onto the scent. Timing is everything. There are just a few weeks every year at the height of the dry season when conditions are good for finding jaguar. Too much rain and the jungle gets too flooded for tracking. Well, the daylight's up now, so what do you think? Yeah, well, it's still very cloudy, so it's good. It's overcast, and by being overcast, yeah. it helps us to work for longer time during the day because we don't have the pressure of the sun on the dogs, on the people, and on the jaguars. So right now it's perfect. At a remote river crossing, Gerardo decides it's time to begin tracking on foot. We're going to look around here yeah. for, a, for the scent, okay? Okay. To see if we can pick it up. Okay. Perfecto. Uno. I think this is good because I heard that jaguars like to hunt near water. And amazingly, jaguars quite like swimming of all the big cats. Jaguars and sometimes tigers, but jaguars are most fond of the water, which is like any domestic cat. Hates getting wet. Excellent, excellent. And yet in so many other ways, jaguars and domestic cats, in fact, all 38 members of the cat family, are incredibly alike. Designed by nature as perfect killers. Razor teeth and claws hidden inside, velvet paws so soft you'd never hear a thing until they were right on top of you. Gerardo, what happens when the dogs get the scent of a, get the scent of a jaguar? What, what happens then? They will start to howl and bark really, really, really uh, uh, loud. And then we, we will release them. And then all of them will start to run. Then the jaguar hopefully will climb up with the tree. Yeah. We will arrive and dart it, put it back here, and then do all of our work of measuring it. And, uh, on the forest floor. On the forest floor, yeah. taking blood samples, uh, uh, all kind of uh, information that we need from that animal. Gosh. Better catch up. Yes. After a few hours, it becomes too bright and too hot, and our chances of finding a jaguar drop significantly. There's no scent. Very disappointing. We don't have it around here, apparently. So we will keep on trying to, to find it. But for today, at least, the jaguar hunt is over. Next morning, we're up again at the crack of dawn, followed by several hours tracking through the forest. But still, nothing. 
I'm starting to think jaguars really are just misty vapours, a feeling not helped by some very unseasonal rains, which fall every single day. Gerardo, this is the, supposed to be the dry season. Is this climate change? Because it shouldn't be as wet as this now, should it? No, we have some uh, unusual uh, rains. It's not uh, actually typical that we have any rain. After several days of searching, I'm still no nearer my first jaguar. It seems my luck has run out. I just can't believe it. This is supposed to be the dry season, and it's turned out to be the rainiest of rainy seasons. And we've been going out with the dogs and tracking and waiting and looking and doing every possible thing you can think of. To not appear, not one sign, not one sniff. So we're just going to have to call it a day. It feels strangely like England. It's Mexico. But my luck may be in after all. It seems there's another project, not too far away, that could help me see what I came here for. We're leaving Mexico, where we didn't manage to see any jaguar. We're flying to Belize, where I know we'll see some. They won't be in the wild, but it'll be the next best thing. A hundred miles as the parrot flies, in another part of the same Mayan jungle, is Bowdoin Creek Ecological Preserve. Thirteen thousand acres of virgin rainforest saved from destruction over ten years ago by this man, Ken Karras. This forest is home to around 150 jaguar. Yet in all the years Ken's lived here, he's hardly seen them. Very rarely will you see a jaguar in the wild. Um, it's just just so difficult to see them. They're ambush predators, they wait, they maneuver into position, they pounce and strike, and in one blow, they've killed their prey. They don't chase it. They can't. How can you chase something through a thick jungle like that? You can't. It's a description which rings so many bells. It could be any cat stalking a mouse or a sparrow, a ruthless killer that can suddenly vanish without a sound. No wonder the ancient Americans saw the jaguar as a magical creature. Tragically, I now think seeing a jaguar in the wild would require a small miracle. But there are two jaguars I can see. Six years ago, Ken rescued a pair of cubs from life in a zoo and brought them here to the heart of the jungle. Meet Bosch and Shupi, jaguars and brothers. Look at that great black creature. Look at that. So where were they born? They were part of a captive breeding program. And um, instead of going to uh, a typical zoo in Mexico, we decided to bring them here to help with uh, getting people to understand conflicts with jaguars in the area. Ken, there are going to be people who say huge cats like this shouldn't be kept in an enclosure. Well, they can't go into the wild, can they? No. You, you know, they would not be able to survive. They don't know how to hunt. Some people might say, well, maybe we can train them like we train cheetahs or others to go back wild, but we don't know enough about them. Um, jaguars are the least studied of all the cats, because how do you study something you can't really find every day? And, you know, what we really want people to understand is here's what they're like. Here's yeah. this great icon. Yeah. And there they are out in the forest. Yes. And that forest is teeming with them. And this is and why you have to say out. that. Exactly. I can't believe how beautiful they are. The dark and the light, the yin and the yang. And here's Bosch, black as anything, with just dappled things. And Shupi, coloured like sort of sunlight in the dappled forest. All the strength and majesty of these creatures, you can exactly see why people would have thought that they contained some sort of godly power, or indeed were gods themselves. It's a pity these boys can't roam free in the jungle. But what a privilege, gazing into the remarkable eyes of the world's most elusive cat. Eyes which burn back with the same wild spirit I used to glimpse in my beloved bee. The same spirit you can still see in every cat alive today. The mystery is why these stealthy little predators ever chose to move in with us. I mean, I know we feed them, but 
they're naturally solitary, they're naturally wild. And they don't do as we tell them, they're not obedient. Maybe that's what some people find so ghastly about them, and what so many millions more like me find so enchanting and adorable. Next time, what happens when we do try to make cats conform to our world? Cats that perform tricks? Cats that wear neckties and false nails? And the big cats that refuse to be tamed and whose future is now in danger? There are more pet cats in the world than ever before. Sensual, cute, enigmatic, stealthy. Every one of them working its wild and ancient magic on our senses. And yet, as I've already found on this journey, cats still perplex and divide us. My quest to understand them has already taken me from a mysterious Egyptian tomb to a breathtaking encounter with the lord of the Mayan jungle. I've learned that inside every cat lurks the same wild hunter spirit. And that's despite nearly 4,000 years in our company. But sadly, man is notoriously bad at leaving nature alone. And so I now want to know what we have done to the cat to mold it to our way of life, and whether our meddling with nature has gone too far. It's a question which will take me from a close encounter with the tongue of a cheetah. No, we aren't. Lovely, raspy tongue. To the cats who formed a rock band. From the woman who knows how to talk to them. Yeah, we'll be at all time. We won't even know what to do with them. She's just starting to speak in cat language. To the tragedy of a leopard locked in a cupboard. She put him in a closet, and that's where he lived all day long. I mean, how he survived that, I don't know. I want to discover whether all is well with one of nature's most enduring partnerships. Between cat and man. Or, of course, woman. If you stop to think for a moment, it's incredible that cats live with us at all. Under the genetic microscope, they've barely changed from the wild, solitary creatures that once roamed the Sahara. Back then, there were no cat packs, no cat herds. It was a true loner, until it found us. It is the weirdest of relationships. I love them madly, but I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that cats are remotely interested in what people want from them. Millions of us own them, but they're... They're not really ours. After all, they don't really need us. They could look after themselves if they had to. But that doesn't mean we've stopped trying to master them, which begs the question, would a cat ever take orders from a mere human? To answer that, I'm in Chicago on a bitter winter's day. It's been said that cats are far too smart to do the dumb tricks we get dogs to do. But whoever said that hadn't been to see one of Chicago's oddest cabaret turns, a circus performed entirely by cats. It looks as though preparations for today's show are already well underway. For the record, I usually have little time for performing animals, any more than I have for zoos or wild animals in captivity. But a cat circus intrigues me. Cats are so famously uncooperative. I'm curious to know how ringmaster Samantha Martin persuades them to do anything at all. Hi, Samantha. Hi. Hi, Joanna. Hi, nice to meet you. You're getting stuff ready for the show? Yep, big show today. So. This little white face listening to you talking. Who's this? Oh, this is T Tuna. Tuna. She's the star of the show. Is she? 
Mm-hmm. Hi, Tuna. Tuna. Uh, what makes Tuna such a good cat for performances? Uh, she's she's very consistent. She has no fear issues whatsoever. Where some of the other cats, uh, some days they perform, sometimes they don't. It's free will. We, you know, we open up the cage. If they don't come out, that means they don't want to come out. <laughs> so we close the cage. We move on to the next trick. But Tuna always wants oh, she, to. She rang the bell. I'm sorry, <laughs> that was the cat ringing the bell. <laughs> Tuna, will yeah. you ring the bell? <laughs> Yes, she's like, attention, attention, come on. <laughs> Here, Tuna, go back to your light, that's quiet. Tuna, she's just switched the light on, sweet cat. Oh, Tuna is, is brilliant, she really <laughs> is. How do you get a cat to do what you want it to do? I can see you're giving her small, small rewards. But... Oh, it, it's, a lot of it has to do, definitely, with a, the, a special treat. You can train a cat to do to, about, just about anything you can train a dog to do. But then where a dog will just be like, I don't care if I only have two breaths left. Whatever you, whatever you want from me, I'll give to you. And cats are like, eh, you know, I don't think so. Dogs will work for love where cats work more for, you know, they want to pay off. They want to see the contract up front. They, they're, they're, they're hard negotiators. Are they your pets as well as your, as well as your oh, absolutely. performers? Oh, absolutely. The cats all live with me. I'm not going to say how many cats I have, but I, you know, I always show I'm single. I'm going to stay that way. <laughs> Do you think Mr. Wright is working out there, Mr. Cat Wright? I somehow I'm doubtful, you know, because not one guy has asked me out after the show. And I mean, I wear this sexy cat outfit. I mean, come on. <laughs> When they said cat circus, I didn't know what to expect. Um, certainly nothing as much fun as this. And the sort of slight sort of dangerous quality of will they, won't they. <laughs> Very exciting. Can't wait for this afternoon's performance. <laughs> Does it matter that your average cat won't fetch a stick or catch a ball? No, of course not. To me, this is much more impressive. Because cats only do the things they want to. And that, in my eyes, is what makes them truly smart. Even so, Tuna and the gang doing tricks is great for a cold Chicago afternoon. But surely cats, compared with dogs, are a bit, well, a bit useless. After all, nobody ever saw a cat bring down an armed robber or guide a blind person across the street. So what do cats do for us? Well, we now know that cats do have an extraordinary power to help those in need. And all they have to be is themselves. I'm back in England at Manchester's Seashell Trust School for children with severe disabilities. There you go. You hold him. Most of the time, these children struggle to communicate with the world around them. But when a cat enters the room, they blossom. This is the sweetest little cat because it's just sitting here very, very gently. Here we are, Gabrielle. Yes, you're not. Yes, you're not. Mio is a pet cat. That's pets as therapy. In Britain, there are now over a hundred therapy cats like Mio, and the number's growing all the time. What a sweet, sweet cat. And the cat is very, very gentle, very peaceful, this rag doll. He's obviously used to it. And you can feel lovely thrumming purr of this creature through here. Yes, he's purring, yes, he's purring. There you go, Jamie. You got the cat? And you see the enjoyment. The faces light up when they have the animals in. It tends to snuggle in. It's amazing. Most of the animals just know that they're dealing with children that have got special needs and they adapt to the situation really nicely. And also, there's some children that won't communicate with people so well and will talk to a cat because they're non-judgmental. And also for people who don't want to be touched, it's nice for them to touch something as, as soft and comforting as a cat. Yes, and to be sat on. I always feel thrilled when a cat comes and sits on my lap. <laughs> oh, how about that? It's deeply moving to see how the warmth and softness of a cat can stir such pleasure in these children. Thank you. Watching the good boy. Good 
girl, good cat. <coughs> yeah. Did that make sense? No, I didn't say it right. Yes. Did it? Yes. Good. 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 Surely anyone who's ever stroked a purring cat can understand this. Feline company can lower blood pressure, improve your mood, and bring companionship to the lonely and the sick. But if cats can change our lives, how have we changed theirs? What price have they paid for our insatiable need to muck about with nature? I mean, this is really one of the strangest little beasts I've ever held on my lap. Instead of us trying to redesign the cat, perhaps we should try to understand how and why nature designed them in the first place. So with my whiskers, if I had whiskers as well, I'd be fantastic. Cats, our favorite 21st century companions. But keeping a cat as personal stress buster is quite a recent thing. For thousands of years, we used them almost exclusively for one job, and one job only, pest controller. And for that, they were supremely designed by nature as one of the world's most efficient killing machines. What is it that makes a cat a triumph of evolutionary engineering? That's something I can now literally see for myself, thanks to the pioneering work of scientist Alvaro Casanelli and his peculiar invention a cat's whiskers headset. Alvaro, will you explain this extraordinary headpiece? Well, it's, um, it's a mask that gives you the ability to sense the space around you, like uh, having cat whiskers. Of course, you don't see them because they are made of light and motor vibrators. So when something gets close to you, yeah. you start vibrating. The, the, the closer you get, the more vibrate. Should we push it on? Yeah, that's right. It looks a bit Hannibal Lecter. But right. there, yeah, it? I like the look. It's to be used in the dark, so nobody will see you. Perfect. That's okay. Good. It's beautiful. So now I will just switch on the motors. Are you ready to have superpowers? Oh, don't. Oh, God. Oh, God. How weird. Uh, yeah. The mask is sending everything wirelessly to this computer. So... up. Try to approach your hand or, uh, yeah, over your mouth. So this is That's the sensor near your mouth. Ooh, ooh. This one. How can I try it out? Well, we will try that on the corridor. A cat's whiskers are the most incredible bits of kit. They're so sensitive to tiny air currents and electrical fields, the cat can sense objects even without touching them and in total darkness. Now... I'm going to find out what that feels like. This is a very strange feeling. So you are, now you have to walk in front of you till the end of the corridor. Yeah. OK. So first whiskers on, and then let me switch the light off. Tell me when the light's off. They are off now. Back in the lab, Alvaro monitors my every move. I can't see a thing. I can feel the buzzing. Right. And I mustn't use my hands. The temptation, of course, is to use your hands. Oh, I can feel something very close to me there. So away from that, away from that. That's a big thing there, I get away from that. Something there. Nothing here. Come on, be bold, Lumley. I can't tell you how frightening this is. If you could hear my heart, it's absolutely hammering. At last, it's lights on, and not a moment too soon. You get lost, you don't know where's the, your direction, where, where you're you don't aiming know if for. Is that all? Is, Is that, that all? all? Yeah, what? also on the elevator, you get stuck there and there. I didn't go into the elevator, did I? No, no. Yeah, you went to the four, fourth floor and I you came back. <laughs> <laughs> no, you get... I had a cup of coffee and I <laughs> No, it was strange how frightening it was. It's strange how odd. I've got a long way to go to be a cat. Of course, when it's stalking a bird or a mouse, a cat has plenty more weapons at its disposal, not least of which is an incredible sense of sight. From just tiny slits in the day to massive moon eyes at night, your pet cat is a whopping six times more sensitive to light than you are. And with the addition of a natty pair of light-intensifying goggles, now I will be too. Yeah, too many things to adjust. OK. So it should be... Tell me how it feels. That feels... The line of sight. Yeah. 
That's good. Okay. So we'll probably switch the light off and we'll oh, see. Oh, I see the light's on. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's so it's too easy. What about now? Oh, okay. No, I can't move. I don't see anything. Okay, but I can. So, okay, now this is me walking with cat's eyes as opposed to cat's whiskers. I have no sense of distance, but here I come. Look, not touching the trees. That's not bad, is it? Oh, this is fantastic. So with my whiskers, if I had whiskers as well, I'd be fantastic. And I've a feeling I even might look slightly like a cat. Do you feel that? Wow. That was extraordinary, Alvaro. It doesn't really make you feel like a cat, but maybe... It doesn't, but it makes me respect cats so much because, of course, they have all this absolutely inbuilt and they know exactly how to use it. I was a complete beginner, you know, but they know perfectly. So cats won't be needing this for a little while yet, beautiful though it is. Thank you for letting me try it out. I think, um... I think I'm just going to look at any old moggy with such respect. A cat's eyes and whiskers were fine-tuned by millions of years of evolution. Sadly, the way some cats look today is the result of just a few generations of biological tampering by us. There are now around a hundred different breeds of cat. Fat ones, skinny ones, flat noses, pointy heads, big balls of fur, or no fur at all. But are they really all the product of our attempts to improve on nature? With the aid of a few hand-picked pedigrees, top cat biologist Roger Tabor explains. It's strange looking around at all these cats, Roger. They're all, um, well, obviously very different. Did we breed them all to look like this? Uh, the simple answer is no. Um, natural selection has happened just as much as man's hand, or woman's hand, because a lot of breeders are women. For example, in a hot climate, you will find, by and large, lighter cats, slimmer cats with shorter coats. When you move away to the chillier north, there's this whole group of really heavy built long hair cats that evolved. And then some of them, of course, we've changed ourselves. But in a funny way, they're all roughly the same size. And yet dogs, when I think of things like a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, why is there such a difference in the size of dogs and really not so much in the size of cats? Dogs are different because through the centuries, dogs were selected for jobs. Yeah. So you had big dogs doing big jobs and yeah. little dogs going for yappy down holes and things yeah. as opposed to ripping things apart. With cats, there has not been this selection pressure by us to get the animal working. Because all, all we really wanted them to do was to look after our grain, didn't we? Absolutely. Mice and rats was our, was our cat. And, and they come as one size, so, so as long as the cat can get can them. <laughs> and therefore, actual positive breeding in the way that we do it now is very recent. We've been doing it to dogs for centuries, and now cats are fast catching up. Wow. By playing mix and match with genetics, we're designing ever more exotic shapes and sizes. But how far are we prepared to go? For some of the world's strangest experiments in cat genetics, there's only one place to look, America. I'm heading for an encounter with a munchkin. That's a cat. In fact, it's the feline equivalent of a dachshund. And it's earned breeder Terry Harris a nickname in the world of pedigree cats. Meet the munchkin queen. So the first munchkin, as far as, as far as you know, was a natural development in the cat. It was just a cat which happened to have short legs, is that right? That's correct. It's a naturally occurring spontaneous mutation. Yeah. The gene that is responsible for the dwarfism shortens only the long bones in the leg. It would be like from your elbow on down. Now this is a strange looking little creature, isn't it? He is different looking from a cat, isn't he? He is a sphinx hybrid, bred to a munchkin, so he has no hair and very short legs. I mean, this is really one of the strangest little beasts I think I've ever held on my lap. But of course, this cat, is, he's not even got any whiskers. No. So this little person obviously goes about his life in a quite different way. I'm starting to see why Terry's called the Munchkin Queen. It seems there's no combination too strange for her to try. This is Maisie. Maisie has three mutations. Maisie. 
She has the folded ear gene from the Scottish Fold. Yes. She has the dwarfing gene from the Munchkin. Yes. And she has this wonderful curly coat from the Laperm Cat. Yes. Look, even her whiskers are munchkined. <laughs> <laughs> little one, look at you, Maisie. Can I hold you, baby? Look at those little ears. This is the, such a little sweet cat. Little sweet cat. Now, Terry, a lot of people would would say, but cats are so beautiful in their original cat shape. Why would you want to make them have short legs? Well, I am a neophile, which means that I like things that are very different and non-traditional. I just think that they're just adorable. They're comical. They come in all different colors, short hair, long hair. And, and just from the moment that I saw one, I just had to have it. This, this mutation doesn't bring about any kind of illness, does it? No, they they don't have any limitations other than perhaps the distance that they can jump. Now, I'm a short woman. I can't jump as far as a tall woman. <laughs> but we jump, nonetheless. Is it right? Do you think you're playing God? If I felt that I was doing something wrong, I would not do it. No. I think that as long as the cats are healthy and happy, there might be a little something for everybody. I do worry that we're taking things too far. If this is the Dachshund cat, what on earth comes next? A Chihuahua cat? A Great Dane cat? Is nature's work so unsatisfactory that we must constantly meddle with it? Next stop, the cat being made to look like a lion. Handsome man. Hi, mommy. And the lion someone wanted to behave like a cat. Just living in a basement? Living in a basement. People are extraordinary. Los Angeles, the home of the alternative lifestyle. The world capital for lavishing more money than cents on your pet. In LA, people who want a designer lifestyle for their designer cat, bring them here to the best little cat house. If you're heading out of town on an all expenses business trip, why not give your cat the same? Five star luxury accommodation under the eyes of manageress Divinity Libby. Divinity? Hi. I'm Joanna. Nice to meet you. Oh, nice are to you? meet you. Good. Can I have a little tour? For sure. Come on in. Look at this. I love cats. I love cats. You know, they have all these things to do. They've got the fish. We have all these catwalks up high. They've got the outside. Yeah, you get the birds. <laughs> little tiny, titchy and the little sort of sofa and chair for yeah. tiny cat sized people. Mm hmm. And do you come in here and play with them? How do you yes. entertain them? Yeah, that's part of our service, is making sure all the cats get a little bit of love. You can see there's lots of toys and stuff. You've done this beautifully. You've taken such care. Thank you. It's lovely and sunny up here. Yes. Upstairs are more lovely rooms. This is certainly quite unlike any cattery I've ever seen before. I only hope these cats appreciate all this finery as much as their owners do. What, what is this up here? This Those looks like a camera. Are, yes, that is a live cat cam. So wherever you are in the world, yeah. if you miss your cat, you can log on and see what they're doing. You can control the cam from, you know, Spain. Divinity also offers first-class feline grooming, and she's about to show me LA's latest and hottest haircut for hip cats. This is Romy. Hi, Romy. And You're Romy's beautiful. a Himalayan. So we're going to do Romy today mm. in a lion clip. And he's going to be such a handsome man when he is all done. We won't even know what to do with him. She's just starting to speak in cat language. Gosh, I wonder if I had such a beautiful cat, you know, divinity, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a clipping on this. Would you? I think that coat looks absolutely sublime. Personally, if it was my cat, I would leave him like this. But some people, they're highly, highly allergic to their cats, and that's the only way they can tolerate living with them. Maybe they shouldn't have cats if, if they can't cope with them. Oh, no. If Romy could speak, I'm sure he wouldn't be begging to have his handsome coat shorn off. So there's your little lion tail coming out, yeah? Look at that tail, darling. That's the cut. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> <I'm> crying. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's so handsome, isn't yes, he? Yes, he's so handsome. No. So when they're all done, mm -hmm. they get a little grooming spray to make them smell wonderful and fresh. And the boys get a little bow tie, and the girls get a little bow. Oh, and since Romy's the little man, we're just going to put this right on him. At oh, least hair can grow back. Unfortunately, some people take much more radical steps to alter their cats. You know, some people get their cats declawed. You don't uh, believe in that, do you? It's illegal in England. It's, uh, they they're it trying to make it illegal here. We actually, um, for a lot of our clients, put on soft paws. Do you know what that is? No. Yeah. They come in fashion colors. So this would just slip on like that. And you glue it on. And you they, glue it on? Mm -hmm, just, a ta just a drop of glue in the bottom. Then it doesn't... It doesn't scratch. Right. Do you think we've gone mad? <laughs> <laughs> no, but do you, Divinity? Because these, these, these are semi-wild animals in a you, funny way. You know, it's a lot of people otherwise... Would we'll declaw them. Or give them away. Or give them away. You see, we, 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 we don't like animals that don't fit into our way of life, do we, right, right. see? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what happens to people. And they go, I didn't like, I, I've got a cat. I didn't like the hair on it. I didn't like the claws on it. I didn't like the way it did this or that. So I've had all that changed. Mm -hmm. I've modified the cat. Right. I think people are very strange. Okay. I've always loved the independence of cats. Surely it's that which makes them unique. Sadly today, it seems that independence is the very thing some cat owners would like to eliminate by turning them into accessories. And there are people for whom a domestic cat has not been enough. People whose quest for a flashy status symbol means going bigger and better, whatever the price. Hidden deep in the Californian hills is a rescue sanctuary for the big cats that people mistakenly thought would make good pets. Lions. Tigers, sadly misplaced beasts, living out their days behind bars. It's run by a woman associated more with wings than claws, actress Tippi Hedren, the star of Hitchcock's terrifying film, The Birds. For the last 30 years, Tippi has devoted her all to rescuing these poor beasts from abuse and neglect. Hi, Patrick. <gasps> this Look is a, a very beautiful animal. He's, he's a liger. His father was a lion and his mother a tigress. And He's um, beautiful. the hybrid grows to be, you know, a great deal larger than, than either the lion or, or the, the tiger. tiger. How yes. extraordinary. Yes. You beautiful thing. He is immense. The problem is that there are so many of these big cats born in captivity to be sold as pets. It's in the tens of thousands and across the United States. It's permitted in the United States? There are... 20 states that have no laws whatsoever. And you can purchase this adorable darling little cub and, you know, by the time it's seven months old, it's destroying your house and uh, taking a good chunk out of you. They're trying to make a, you know, a house kitten out of it. Yes, it never works. No. Nobody can keep a tame tiger at home. They will never be tame. Tippy's sanctuary is home to 83 big cats that have never learned how to survive in the wild. And every one of them comes with a tragic story. <laughs> Will you look at this for a lion? <laughs> if he wasn't blinking, you'd think he was muerto. He looks completely out of it. <laughs> Leo. That's adorable. That is very, very attractive. Leo, Leo was living in a basement with a family, and they had children. And so no going outside for anything, just living in a basement? Living in the basement. People are extraordinary. This beautiful black leopard was uh, purchased in Texas for $6,000. And um, as he grew, he was scratching the lady's satin sofas and chewing her Jimmy Choo's shoes. So she put him in a closet, and that's where he lived all day long. And finally, they brought him in a zippered clothes bag in the trunk of their car. I mean, how he survived that, I don't know. It must be very difficult to know when to draw the line because you must want to rescue every animal in need, but you've got a limited amount of space and... A limited amount of money. A limited amount of money. Yeah. What do it's, you do? A, it's so huge that I can't even think about how we do it. People say, how do you do this? How do you manage this whole thing? Because it's emotional, it's maddening, 
Uh, it's frustrating. It's um, a, a constant worry. Of, it's 24-7. Yeah, it is 24-7, 365. Even celebrity pets are not immune. When a certain superstar's mansion hit the rocks, these two beautiful tigers ended up here without a single cent of support money, or apparently even a phone call to see how they are. There are some terribly sad stories which have brought these creatures here, but yes, now that they are here, this is truly a sanctuary. It's the kind of Garden of Eden you've made for them here. Uh, yes, and uh, it's a lot of work and a real labor of love. For the, and, I, and I love these animals more than my next breath, but they're not pets. No, that's true. They're wild. Yeah. And you can't take that out of them. Man really can be very poor at knowing how to live with nature. And yet we do have this ancient compulsion to share our homes with animals. I'm visiting a cat rescue sanctuary in South London to discover what happens when that compulsion gets out of hand. This has expanded so much since I was last it's here. Right. It's, actually, it's actually twice the size. It's twice the size. This was next For the past 30 years, my old friend and ex-top model, Celia Hammond, has made it her mission to help cats in need. Yeah. Hello. So, and these are what? All, all this is all with? today's intake for surgery, various, you know, new things and various other rocks. Quite a lot to get through today. Do you get pedigree cats in here as well? As unwanted, we often get pedigrees, no. but particularly Persians, because people can't be bothered to groom them. They buy them as little cuddly babies, and then when they grow up and need to be groomed, they get fed up with it. So they come in here completely knotted, or their legs knotted together, they can hardly walk some of them. People don't realise how much work they are. Mm. Celia's sanctuary can house up to 400 animals at any one time. As well as a neutering programme, Celia aims to rehome as many unwanted cats as possible. I find them completely bewitching and walking past the cages and those little level eyes staring out. Mm. You think I better just take some of these home. Well, <laughs> this is wonderful. This is I'm weakening. <laughs> Are you really weakening? I am. <laughs> Many of Celia's rescues are strays or abandoned cats. But we're now on a different kind of mission. Sometimes the problem lies with cat lovers who simply don't know when to say no. There is such a thing as too many cats. Well, it's real hard work to try to persuade people to get their pets neutered. Some people say, I don't care what happens to other people's animals. All I know is I want my cat to have kittens. But they're making the situation worse when there's so many animals being put to sleep yes. every day. How can it be right to bring more into the world than when there's no homes for what's here already? We've come to meet Valerie, whose collection of cats is not going down too well with the neighbours. Hi, Valerie. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Valerie. How are you? How nice, nice to, to see you. you. Oh, look, you've got a little person here. Yes. It's so cute, this one. Called what? Oh, I haven't You haven't got lips. No, it's a <gasps> baby. Oh, come in. Valerie. Valerie now has 21 cats crammed into her tiny flat. At the moment, they all look clean and well-fed. But without some drastic measures, soon she won't be able to keep up. Look! Cats galore. Hello, kittens. Hello, cats. And are they mostly related to each other? Yeah. They're all one big family. Are one they? big happy family. But, Valerie, look, you absolutely love cats, don't you? When did you yeah. fall in love with cats? Can you remember? I loved cats from when I was a little girl, really, you know. But uh, I started off with one cat. And my one cat had five kittens and I got that cat done. But the kittens now, I didn't know how young they had to start off with having kittens. And uh, it's accumulated, you see. This is like that thing of uh, when I was going to St Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Seven wives had seven cats, or seven, seven cats had seven kits. And suddenly it just goes out and out. On and, and out, on, it? yeah, but I'm having no more kittens now. I can't afford them, they eat a lot. So what, do you, what are you going to do? You're going to get them neutered? Yeah, I will be getting them neutered. I've got two neutered already. Or is it three? But um, Celia's very helpful in that section there. We're going to get them all done, Valerie, aren't we? Yeah, need to get them all, all done. It makes I sense, can't take it? No, yeah. They eat more than me. What I feel sorry for myself in the supermarket. When I look, it's all cat food. I hope people don't think it's for me. <laughs> 
I think Valerie simply hadn't realised how quickly the numbers would explode. But for some people, and strangely enough it's nearly always women, compulsive cat hoarding is now a real and recognised clinical condition. What's happening? They're canoodling down here. Mm? They're not muted yet, and they're canoodling. Canoodling. Mm? Stop it. Valerie, I think we've got to stop the canoodling eventually, haven't we? Because yeah, too much canoodling, too and you'll suddenly have no, 4,000 I'll be cats. slim. I won't be eating anything. With two more of Valerie's cats off to be neutered, hopefully this particular cat family will stop spiralling out of control. It's all right, darling. We've been seduced by the cat, by the untamed heart it shares with its big cousins. It's a privilege to live side by side with them, but with that comes responsibility. And that's true whether they sleep on our sofas or simply walk on our land. Next stop, the ultimate wild cat country, Namibia. This is just staggering. It must have been like this since time began. Where I'm about to come face to face with a cat we're in danger of wiping off the face of this earth. I hope you like flies. I don't mind flies. Quietly, cleanly, and with great poise and self-assurance, the cat has overtaken the dog as our favourite companion. But for all our efforts to master and redesign them, cats are still, at heart, as wild as they ever were. When you compare them with their larger cousins, you recognise the same predatory instincts that we watch with fascination in our back gardens. The big difference is, our response to these cats all too often comes from the end of a gun. But why? For one cat especially, the presence of humans is pushing it to the brink of extinction. 3,000 cheetahs, that's a quarter of the world's remaining cheetah population, live right here on the open plains of Namibia. This country is the front line in a battle to save them. And local conservationist Dave Houghton is a true veteran of the fight. I'm heading skyward with Dave to get a clearer picture of the thing that's brought man and cat into bitter conflict, the land itself. This is just staggering, the size of this Spain. It must have been like this since time began, really, do you think? Yeah, this is country that big cats have been in for millions of years. And then men came along and passed it up into little blocks for farms. And you get the inevitable human wildlife conflict. And who's winning? I'm afraid it's man at the moment, but uh, we are making big inroads into trying to get that balance right. Beautiful, then. Beautiful. Dave is the head honcho of Africat, a charity that's fighting to save cheetahs from trigger-happy farmers. Rather than shooting or poisoning a predatory cat, farmers can call Dave to trap it and bring it here, to Africat's 10,000 acres of protected bush. Africat now feeds and cares for 84 rescued cheetahs that would otherwise have been killed. And here are three of them. Pippin, Measles and Knossos. So beautiful. Why do you think they have these gorgeous... Is it just it's black a, marks? What is it? It's a Bushman folklore. A mother lost her babies. And that's basically what's left over from the tears of her crying for her babies. These three cats are now too old to hunt effectively in the wild. But Dave's about to move them into a brand new 120-acre camp where they can live out their days in peace. Wildlife vet Mark Jago is on hand to give them a full medical. I think it's that guy so he's starting to wave. OK, you can go in there now. Is that one in the middle? Yes, you see him now? He's just wobbling a bit. I just want to check that he is down first. First step to get this sleepy cat out of the hot sun. Uh, if I get the front... Yes. Let me just pull him out a bit, because there's a thorn bush there. Yeah. You have to watch the flies, eh? Yeah. If you hold the base of the tail there... Yes. ...and then put your other hand underneath... ..under here. Under know? here? Yeah. Yeah. OK? Yeah. Right. I had no idea I'd be getting quite so close to a cheetah. I hope you like flies. I don't mind flies. This is fantastic. Yeah. 
Next, we head off to the clinic for a full health check. We're going to start here with the eyes. Check the eyes up, make sure there's no injury, anything like that. And uh, you can see how the pupils are incredibly clear. 100%. Right. To make myself useful, I've agreed to some heavy duty grooming. I thought I knew how to detangle cat fur, but this is different. Golly, some of these are. Pretty much in, aren't they? Yeah. What do you do? You scrag them out. You no, 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 Whenever possible, Africat releases rescued cheetahs well away from the farms where they were captured. But sometimes the young, the infirm, or in this case, the elderly, become too dependent on us to survive on their own in the wild. Which is such a shame. Well, tell me, an animal like this, which does 80 miles an hour, how can it ever live a, a natural life in no, captive? It, it, it can't, can it? it? Can't, yeah. So you can keep it... Groomed and healthy sure, and alive and everything, but, but yeah. it wouldn't be living like no, a no. cheetah. No, I think it's something we've got to recognise. That you know, as much as we try and improve the conditions in captivity, what we really are working towards is looking at the animals healthy, happy, and conserved in the wild. Yeah, because um, that's where they should be. It's reassuring to know there are projects like this, but it's depressing to encounter yet one more example of mankind's inability to live and let live especially where cats are concerned. Oh, Once our three patients have recovered from their drugs, it's time to release them into their new enclosure. Me? Yeah. Dave's wife, Carla, lends a hand. Are we ready? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Hang on. <laughs> I normally just put my fingers half in the hole, because then you get a bit of... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Go. Okay. It's a rocket. It's kind of quite frightening because as you put your fingers just there, there's this sort of excited head comes banging up, and without being too sort of scaredy cat, you sort of think, I don't want to lose the fingers. Too old to hunt they may be, but now Pippin, Measles, and Knossus will have plenty of space and protection from the gun. In another Africat enclosure, I'm waiting for Dave and Carla, who've promised me a special treat. God, look at that. That's one of the thick purring, sir. Hello, Tony. Come on, you can spend later to see the shed. Come on. Pugsley and Gomez. Rescued as tiny cubs when their mother was killed by a farmer, there was no choice but to rear these two stunning creatures by hand, which has made them pretty much as tame as a cheetah is ever likely to be. There's my boy. Mm. Yes. Where's a good boy? Huh? Look at your eyes. They're huge, aren't they? Where's my boy? No, we aren't. Lovely raspberry too. That's lovely, darling. It's extraordinary. Apart from everything being on a slightly different scale, i.e. the purr is 40 mm -hmm. times louder yeah. and the limbs are X longer, they're so like domestic cats, that yeah. licking and flopping. Look, he just loves that. I'm incredibly privileged to be so close to these beautiful cats, but it would be a mistake to think they make good pets. We must always remember that they're, they're wild animals. So really wild animals should stay in the wild and not be in somebody's flat in Bristol or something, you know. It's, no, it's, it's not fair on the animal for a start, no. you know. I'm trying to talk normally with them, my arm being licked by a cheetah. It's just extraordinary. This is so good of them to come and... To, uh, well, there we are. <laughs> just like a cat. But to, to do that graceful thing of welcoming a stranger was very nice. 
I've seen and held and been licked by so many cats on this journey. This cat is so much bigger, but in a way, it's no different from any of them. The throbbing purr, soft fur, needle-sharp teeth, the faraway look in the eyes, and the calm that comes from the presence of something so free and untamed, just like our cats back home. Well, it's been amazing seeing the big cats here. Utterly, utterly thrilling. And it just seems to me that we seem to have made our peace with domestic cats. They've come down out of the wild and we know exactly how to live with them. We love them dearly and they love us. We haven't quite managed that with the wild cats. With the big cats, we've got to do that to conserve them. After all, all this, all this was theirs before it was ours. So we've got to learn how to share it, I think. Hopefully the Namibian cheetahs will survive. Their domestic cousins, meanwhile, are in no such danger. What a fascinating journey in their company. From an Egyptian tomb, to cats with short legs, cats dressed as mice, cats thrown off tall buildings, cats simply too gorgeous to resist, and cats in the Mayan jungles of Belize. All the cats I've met have shown the same wonderful sense of independence. And I think to truly love these animals, you've got to appreciate the wildness in them. That free spirit which still burns so bright after nearly 4,000 years in our company. And more than anything else, it's the untamed heart that bewitches me. Makes me proud to be a cat woman. <laughs>